Our next speaker is Dr. Malone, who is going to discuss balance and how we reach from the bed to the bath and beyond safely. Is that okay? <laughs> And I must admit, it isn't something I made up. I was talking to a recreational therapist, and he was telling me that that's what he uses. So, <laughs> Dr. Malone is assistant professor at the University of Colorado School of Medicine under the Division of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation in the Physical Therapy Program. He received his master's and doctorate degree from Temple University in Philadelphia. Dr. Malone's special interest is on the clinical side of both the acute care physical therapy and pulmonary and cardiac rehabilitation. His primary research interest is early mobilization in the intensive care of which he has many publications. I give you Dr. Malone. So I hold no stock in Bed Bath & Beyond. I had nothing to do with that. So, um, for this presentation, I want to start big picture. So we're going to talk about ba balance and falls as a big picture item. Then we're going to bring it down a little bit more to the specifics related to folks with lung disease. Going to give you some uh, tips, some strategies uh, of how physical therapists, but other practitioners, respiratory therapists, nurses, docs may actually examine and try to determine if you have a balance change. And then we're gonna talk about some very simple modifications that can be done at the home. Because from what you'll see from the big picture item perspective, balance and falls is a huge issue. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Can I, can I just ask, how many of you are familiar with balance and people falling, especially older adults being a big issue? Right, it's a big issue from a personal standpoint. Right, I can tell you personally, my father, um, he had fallen five times in three days. The final fall, um, he had always had a, an arthritic hip, but the final fall eventually drove him to the point where he ended up having to have a hip replacement. He was in a hip replacement, you're supposed to be in and out of the hospital in a couple days. A week and a half later, he was finally discharged from the hospital. He ended up in a skilled nursing facility where he had extended rehabilitation for about three weeks. And he came home and he still wasn't to the point where he was really up and walking as well as he was before the surgery. And that was terribly disappointing for him. Now I'm happy to say the story has actually ended up pretty good. He's, he's better now, he's pain free. His walking ability is still a little challenged, but he's doing much, much better. So to me, balance falls had a very personal meaning to me. So again, we're gonna start big picture, bring it in a little bit to some more personal items, and then take it big picture again. All right, so what is a fall? A fall is any event where you basically end up at a lower level than where you started. Thank you. So, can I ask just a show of hands? Thinking of this definition, now this is like kind of a Webster's definition. How many of you have ever been up and walking or you get up and out of bed, or you get up off of the toilet, you're getting out of the shower, the bathtub, whatever, have ever had an unexpected moment where you've ended up at a lower level? We have a room full of fallers, it looks like. All right, so this is, this is an important to topic. Now, here's some big picture items. More than a third of adults older than 65 will fall. Among those falls, you can see that injury and death, death, I mean, my goodness, I mean, wow, is a serious consequence. 2.2 million people will be treated in emergency departments because of a fall and an injury related to the fall. Over half a million people will be hospitalized because of that fall. Now, as we kind of digest some of these, these are just numbers, but do you think from a public health perspective, big deal, right? Do we think CMS, do we think health insurance, do you think they want to prevent ER visits? Do you think they want to prevent hospitalization. 
And then once someone falls, if I use my father as an example, he couldn't go home right away. So now he needed to go to a nursing facility for three weeks, get more rehabilitation, and then when he came home, he required home care therapies. I mean, so this is not, this is an individual burden. You know, and if we take it back from a government health care perspective, it's a big health care economics burden as well. So again, balance falls is, is kind of a big issue. And we can see $55 billion, and that was in 2007 dollars, and we all know the dollar hasn't gone down, right? So the dollar cost has obviously gone up tremendously. Some other numbers. 20 to 30 percent of people who fall can suffer an injury, be it a bruise or worst case scenario is hip fracture. Hip fracture is a huge issue. Hip fracture is a result of a fall. Most people, especially the older adult, 65 and older, if you fracture your hip, you may not, never recover to your baseline. That's terrible. We, we shouldn't accept that as an outcome. Right? We should not accept that. And the last thing, look, every hour there are two deaths related to a, uh, related to a fall. I mean, I just, I look at this and, and my mind just goes, wow. Graphically, just looking at the numbers, right? Just looking graphically, you can see that the unintentional fall rate, mortality, the death rate associated with falls is, is increasing. We need to stop this. We definitely need to stop this. All right. Now, why? Why do people fall? What are the risks? I think if we think about these a little bit, these all make tremendous sense. Muscle weakness, right? If we lose our balance a little bit, do we have the strength to correct and remain upright? Foot problems, we'll talk a little bit later about how you know, the range of motion, the flexibility of your foot and ankle is really important. Heart rhythms, right? So this is a pulmonary conference, but we can throw a little cardio in there as well. You know, there's many heart rhythms. Can I ask in the room, does anyone in this room have atrial fibrillation? Yeah, several people, right? That's a heart rhythm. It can be easily managed. Hopefully it's managed very well. History of falls. Once someone falls once, and it seemed like if just from a general sense, about 60 to 70 percent of folks in this room have had a fall by the textbook definition. Once you fall in once, there is a greater risk of falling a second or third time. Vision changes, right? So when we think of balance, when I think of balance, there are three major components to being in balance. Eyesight, strength of your legs, and can you feel the sensation of your legs? So those three things, so we talked about weakness and strength, Vision problems can, can lead to fall risk, and dizziness is, is also another thing. And people who take more than four medications. How many of you folks take more than four medications right now? I'm, I'd be surprised if it isn't 100% of the room, right? Now again, that's, this, this is a risk of fall. This does not mean, what I'm saying does not mean you are going to fall. This means you have an, a risk you have more of a risk than somebody who's only taking two medications. More of a risk of somebody who has never fallen before. All right, simply risk. This, this does not mean absolutes. All right, so I'm not sure if you uh, uh, have ever seen something like this, but falling is not a natural part of the aging process. We should not accept this. All right? Just like memory loss is not a normal part of aging. It may be a consequence and the risks are higher, but it is, should not be accepted as this is just what happens. If you have fallen, if you are a frequent faller, if you don't mind me giving you a little advice, get it checked out. All right. So again, some other things to think about with regards to fall risk. I've kind of mentioned a couple of these. Flexibility in your legs, especially your ankles. All right, think about, I don't know if I can demonstrate here, but I'll yell it out real loud. When someone starts to lose their balance, what do you do? You either step to get it, or some people, you ever just sway? Right? The more flexibility, the more flexibility you have in your ankle and your legs, the better your sway is. 
the easier it is to step. So doing simple stretches of your legs, your ankles, makes tremendous sense. It can help actually maintain your balance today and tomorrow. Muscle strength in and around the ankles, knees, and hips. Now, we'll see coming forward in a little bit that pretty much generally, if you have lung disease, you are weaker than someone without lung disease. However, you can always get stronger. That's a fact. It's easier to build, tear down a house than it is to build it up again, right? Think about how many of you guys have ever been in the hospital for a day or two, right? It's a terrible thing, right? And getting back up on your feet is just a challenge, am I right? Right, you're weak, you lose it, right? If you don't lose it, or pardon me, if you don't use it, what happens? You lose it, right? We all know that. But they don't tell you the second part of that phrase. You can get it back. Unfortunately, it takes a lot longer time and a lot more effort, but it can be gotten back. Slower walking speed. Gait speed in the physical therapy world, we're calling it the sixth vital sign. When someone doesn't walk quickly, and usually there's many reasons why they can't walk quickly, we know that many other health outcomes are on the negative side. So walking speed is a challenge. All right? How many of you guys have ever had a six minute walk test done? We can calculate your walking speed from that. All right? I don't know if you're inclined, but if you could figure out what your distance was and you know your time, you can ultimately figure out what your miles per hour were. And the big issue with walking speed is if your walking speed is less than 1.2 meters per second, that's how quickly you need to get across the street when the light is green to before it turns red. Right? Kind of an important walking speed number. So we can work on that calculation at any point in time. Other things, balance, coordination, reaction times. We've already talked a little bit about vision and sensation and just simply being uh, inactive. Fear of falling. If you've fallen once, many folks are a little hesitant, a little reticent to get up and do whatever that activity was that led to that original fall you now have a fear of falling. I mean, it's, it's a scary thing. Well, what happens if you have a fear of falling many times, activities that you could do, you now choose not to do. Now, I gotta admit, I think that makes rational sense, right? I was walking up this curb, I was walking up this hill, I fell. I'm not gonna walk up that curb, I'm not gonna walk up that hill again. Well, what happens? Well, maybe not walking up a curb means I'm not going to feel comfortable walking upstairs. So what do I do? I stop walking upstairs, even if I'm able to. So you lose that little bit of endurance. You lose that little bit of strength. Now, fear of falling is a real risk. And a lot of times I would say it's, it's an unconscious thing. We don't even thinking about it. But it is something just to keep in the back of our minds. All right. So we t looked at this little image. Weakness, foot problems, rhythm problems, medications, dizziness, etc. Let's talk a little bit. I'm going to start bringing it down to some lung disease specific. So let's bring it down a little bit. All right. So this was a study where they simply looked at muscle strength, people with and without COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And I think we can all see that the, the, the open bar that's the folks with COPD, with the folks with lung disease, you can see that these major muscle groups, so the quadriceps, that's the muscle that makes your knee go straight. The pectoralis muscle, muscle that's the muscle that we would do a push-up with. All right? If you ever get up and out of bed, if you go from laying on your back to sitting up out of bed, you've used your pectoralis muscle. Latissimus dorsi, that's the muscle you kind of use if you ever do a chin-up. Well, if you ever reach for something and bring it towards your body, you're using the latissimus dorsi. So you can see that these major muscle groups, and these are just three different muscle groups, you can see that folks with lung disease generally are weaker than folks without lung disease. All right? Now this is just numerically looking at a different study, but some of the same kind of information. So if you just look at the red numbers, right, you know that all the red numbers are less than the black numbers. 
And this is just looking at other muscles. So we have that knee extension, that's that quadriceps again. You guys have all heard of hamstrings, right? That's your knee flexors. Plantar flexion is the ability to stand up on your toes to reach something in a high shelf. You have to do plantar flexion. Dorsiflexion is one of the major muscles of your ankle. That helps with balance as well, but that also is a major muscle to help us walk normally. And you can see that across the board, people with COPD are generally weaker than people without COPD. Now, there's a bunch of different balance tests, and we're going to talk about a couple of them coming, going forward, but the best test, the Berg balance, and the ABC, these are just different uh, 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 tests that look at a, a lot of different activities, like the ability to get up from a chair. How quickly can you do it? Can you stand on one foot? Can you stand with one foot in front of the other? Right? These are all kind of components of these different balance tests. And again, a higher number in this case is generally better. And you can see that the control, the people without lung problems, they score better. In other words, the red numbers, people with COPD score worse. Their balance is impaired compared to the non-COPD folks. All right. This is fear of falling. A higher number means a greater fear of falling. People with COPD generally have a greater fear of falling. And the one at the bottom, I'll just take your, if you look down to falls in the previous year, if you had COPD, again, this is just this one study, 13 falls compared to seven. So substantial. So I think I've, I hope I've painted the picture that falls are a big society risk. It's a big population risk. But if you have lung disease, it's also a risk. In fact, it might actually be, unfortunately, greater. This is looking at uh, bone mineral density, because one of the big consequences of a fall could be a fracture. And if you have a loss of bone mineral density, osteoporosis, there's the risk of a fracture. And are you guys familiar with gold? the Global Initiative for Obstructive Lung Disease. So the higher the gold stage, the worse the lung function. And you can see, if you look at the yellow and the red, the yellow and the red gets a larger proportion as the lung disease gets worse. So there's a relationship, don't know exactly what it is, but there seems to be a relationship between loss of bone mineral density osteopenia, osteoporosis, as lung disease gets worse. All right, so if we kind of tally some of these facts up, we know that when someone has lung disease, they don't typically have a normal walking speed and they can't walk as far. Muscle strength is gonna be a little bit lower. There's an increased risk of osteoporosis, loss of bone mineral density. There's an increased fear of falling there's not only an increased fear, but there's actually an increased rate number of falls. So, there's a risk. Can we do anything about it? So, there's some very global things that we can do and some very individual specific things we can do. Now, I would imagine because you're sitting here attending this conference that many of you are go-getters. How many here have been through pulmonary rehab? Let's hear it for pulmonary rehab, right? Right? Whoop, whoop. Pulmonary rehab increases your physical activity. Pulmonary rehab increases your education about your lung process. All right, so pulmonary rehab is a, I would say it's a necessary, it should be an absolute part of management, of not just balance and fault, lung disease in general. You know that. You're sitting here. You know that. But we need to remain active when the pulmonary rehab program is over. After those 12 weeks, three days a week, 36 sessions, you put yourself through that. You worked hard. You achieved a fabulous outcome. You improved your strength, your flexibility, your endurance. Your six minute walk test improved, which meant your gait speed improved. You reduced your risk of falls. Do you maintain that level of fitness it's hard, it's hard to do that, right, when you don't have that external coaching. 
but maintain activity. Because don't forget, it's easier to break it down than it is to build it up again. So the more you maintain, the better it will always be. All right. Now, simple ways of determining if you're at a fall risk. Now, look at the bottom. There is a do not attempt to do this alone. That's a disclaimer. All right? So what I'd like you to think about doing, can you stand on one leg for 30 seconds? Try it when you get home. Try it when you get home. Stand next to a, a sturdy piece of furniture or a countertop. All right? Face the countertop. Lift your leg up. Have a loved one next to you. Because if you fall, we don't want you to fall because there's a fall, with a fall, there's a potential risk. And we already know that people with lung disease as a whole, again, I'm a little bit of a generalization here, but your bone mineral density is less than mine. Right? So be safe about it. 30 second little test. All right. There's some other tests that especially we in the rehabilitation world like to do. Have you ever heard of a tug? Timed up and go. You're sitting in a chair. You stand up, you walk 10 feet, turn around, and sit down again. Very simple to do. However, there's actually a lot of information that comes out of that ability to get up and walk, turn around, and come sit down again. We get to look at what is your sitting balance? How well can you get up from a chair with or without using your arms? What is the quality of your walking when you're walking 10 feet forward, 10 feet back? What is your ability to stay upright, your balance, when you make a sudden turn? That's when falls usually happen, when there's a change in position, a change in turning. All right? So there's different things that we look at. Now, I can tell you, here's at the bottom of this page is some norms. So if you're between the ages of 6 and 69, you should be able to get up from a chair, walk 10 feet, turn around, and sit down in less than 8 seconds. That's quick. That's quick. All right? That's norms. That's people without any lung problem, norms, which is not exactly what we're talking about here. There's another way we kind of look at it. It's called the functional reach test. I don't know if any of you have ever done this, but basically you're standing upright and you reach forward, and the farther you reach forward, if you maintain your balance, the better. If someone can't reach six inches, they have a distinct fall risk. So you think about it, if I'm standing here, right, if I'm standing here and I reach forward six inches, how much trunk stability, core stability do I have? How much strength do I have in my legs? How much flexibility, range of motion do I have in my foot and ankle? Imagine if, you, if I reach forward and I couldn't move my ankles. I can't do it, right? So that would that increases my fall risk. So the functional reach test, very simple test that a lot of the rehabilitation folks like to do. All right, um, I'm gonna skip to this one. So this was folks in pulmonary rehab. So people with lung disease who did a distinct program to improve balance. And if you look at the intervention group, so these are the folks that within the pulmonary rehab program, they were doing exercises specifically to address balance, you can see that the Berg balance test, the PF10, and the chair stand test all got better from pre to post. Excellent. So if you have a balance problem and you do distinct balance exercises, even if you have lung problems, you can improve your balance. That's the take home message. Now what did they do? Very simple. They did stance, transition, gait, and functional training. I'll just show you some examples of this. Stance exercises. Your feet together, gonna be pretty stable. If you put them in tandem or full tandem, you're now reducing your base of support, which means it's gonna be harder to balance. So they did these varied tasks, and they did them with eyes open. They did them with eyes closed. Now, if you're doing these, this kind of a semi-tandem stance with your eyes closed, because remember, vision is part of our balance system, it's really hard to do. All right, or maybe tossing a ball back and forth. So now you've got to coordinate your upper body and flexibility and coordination with that. Transition exercises. This is my favorite. Sit to stand. If, if I could give 
one exercise for everybody in the room to do forever, sit to stand. Go from a sitting position to a standing position. And you can do it in different ways. How many can you do in 30 seconds? Or do it another way. Just do it five times, regardless of how long it takes. Right? So you can either make the number of repetitions the key variable, or you can make time the variable. But think about it. If you're going from sitting to standing, you're challenging your sitting balance, your standing balance. You're challenging the, legs, the muscles around your ankle. You're challenging the muscles around your hips and your knees. And then once you stand up, you're, again, it's standing balance, so your core a little bit. Simple little exercise to do. We should be doing it over and over and over and over and over again. As many as you can. Three sets of 10, the hell with that. 10 sets of 10. 20 sets of 10. Do it. It, it. I really do think it is the single best exercise that we could all do. Stair taps. If you're stable in standing, you know, have a good uh, 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 arm support to keep your balance. And then try to just tap your foot on a stair. So now you're looking at single leg stance, right? Because when that one foot is tapping the stair, you're standing on one foot, right? Do one foot at a time. Do the other foot. Alternate. Let one hand go. When you're starting to feel really a little bit nutty, let both hands go, right? But be safe about it. Start with two hands, right? Get a metronome. How many of you guys have a smartphone? Metronome app is free, 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 free. Start with a, you know, beats per minute of 30. That's one tap every two seconds. It's a slow tap, right? Simple to do. All right. Gait exercises. Walking forward, walking backwards, walking sideways. How about walking on level ground? Walk outside. Walk an obstacle course over a bucket, preferably empty, turned on its side, uh, turned over. I mean, just whatever you want to do. You, this is what they did in this pulmonary rehab program. I think we can start to do perhaps some of these on our own, right? So again, being safe about it. Functional strengthening, little squats. I, mean, I think little squats are the same as doing the sit to stand. Lateral step up, so not just facing the stair, but being sideways to the stair and stepping up and down. It emphasizes a different muscle group, okay? Just things to think about. All right, this was, do you remember we, we talked about that tug, timed up and go? So this is the tug results for that study of the, the people in the pulmonary rehab program that did those exercises. And we can see that the tug scores went down. So remember, tug, the, time, the, the issue with tug, the variable that we're interested in is time. And a normal time for someone older than 60 is around eight seconds. So most of these folks started around eight, nine, 10 seconds, but by the end of the pulmonary rehab program, they were below eight. Excellent. Back to a normal value. Pretty great result. All right. So, what are some things we can do? So, what we've been talking mostly about are intrinsic factors that impact balance. These are factors that impact you specifically. Your strength, your flexibility, your vision. Let's think about them, some things that are external to ourselves, extrinsic factors. Now, we've already talked about a couple of them, right? If you take more than four prescription medicines, the medicine is an external factor that impacts your, uh, impacts your balance, or your risk of falls, pardon me. What about stairs? Clutter in the house, a wet floor, loose rugs, lighting. One that I think hits many people in this room. It says cords, let's call it oxygen tubing, right? Very challenging, right? You've got a 100, 150 foot cord, and it gets, it gets everywhere you don't want it to, right? You're walking across the floor and then bam, your head pulls back, it's called a nose wedgie, <laughs> right? And if your balance is a little impaired 
and you're pulled backwards suddenly because your momentum's taking you forward, you could fall to the ground. So it's a risk. So cord is a big thing. Hurrying and rushing when not necessary. All right. Again, I think I've hit this point pretty good. What can we do to prevent falls? Maintain activity. All right. Be active, active, active as much as you can. I think it's really important. You should talk to your primary care doc about the medicines you take. All right. Unfortunately, sometimes in the world that we live in, the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing all the time. So do you do a, a medication review with your doctor, your nurses, et cetera? Really, a, a, a really important thing to think about doing. Have you had your vision checked lately? Your vision might change suddenly over time. If you haven't had been to a, a, a vision specialist in a year, it might be time to go back. And home safety hazards. All right, so pulmonary rehab is wonderful. You've been through it once. I don't know if your insurance provider will pay for it again, but there's no harm in asking. Walking, remain as active as you can. Lift weights at home. If you don't have weights, get a soup can. Get a milk jug. Right, if you have an empty milk jug, fill it with water. The more water, the heavier it is. Right? Tai Chi, yoga have really been proven to help with balance improvement. All right? There's, I've seen chair yoga. I've seen chair Tai Chi advertised. If you can't do it in standing, do it in a chair. It's still going to challenge balance. Aerobic exercise, bowling, dancing, gardening, it's all exercise, I think. All right? Make your home safe. Lighting is probably the simplest thing that we can change. The more light, the less risk of a fall event. Don't be afraid of grab bars. Finally convinced my father to get grab bars in the house. Not just in the house, but also my father loves to sit outside. Right? And it's one large step down to the patio. We got him a grab bar and a ramp. Has reduced his fall risk, which I think is really great. All right? Grab bars are a great thing. All right? And the image on the right, the, uh, in the corner there, is clutter. All right? We all have clutter. Can't help it ha but have clutter. But it is a fall risk. You can trip on it. You can slip on it, et cetera. All right? So just some helpful tips. Get rid of anything that you can trip over, except your oxygen tubing. You can't get rid of that, unfortunately. I wish there was a better way of doing it, and I, there isn't yet. You know, I know concentrators and things like that are becoming smaller and smaller and smaller and more portable, more portable, more portable, but I don't know if we can, can, can do much with this. Um, do they sell colored oxygen tubing? Would that help? I mean, clear is certainly great when we're out of the house and everything like that, but damn, I can't see it on the floor. So, I don't know. Again, grab bars. I think they're a wonderful asset. All right? Make sure they're secure. All right? Pulling up from uh, a countertop or um, you know, uh, uh, an insecure grab bar or the, the sink, those things weren't designed to maintain body weight. So you could be pulling up from the sink that's in front of you, and you're going to pull that sink off the wall. So grab bars, you know, especially make sure they're in a stud, et cetera. You might want to try a contractor to help with that. Talked about lights a lot, especially night lights um, uh, are important. So just some simple things to ask yourself. Is there clutter? Is there liquid food on the floor? Are, thro are throw rug rugs in the way? All right, are they in your normal walking path? Remove them. Do you have to walk over cords? Electrical cords is what they focused on here, but I think oxygen tubing falls in this a lot, and that's a really big challenge. Is lighting adequate? Really. Stools, chairs, are they stable? Do they have good firm armrests that can help? Are there stairs or other hazards within the house that can be mitigated a little bit? All right, that's all I got. I thank you for your time. Thanks for inviting me. So the question is uh, why and how does COPD, lung disease, uh, 
uh, affect balance and falling? Well, I, the simple answer is there's no simple answer. The simple answer is it's multifactorial. No doubt, there's some data we showed that when people have lung disease, they're, they have more weakness, less strength than the same individual at the same age who doesn't have lung disease. So that's certainly part of it. I would imagine that people who have lung disease because of your shortness of breath, your fatigue, you don't maintain a normal activity level. It's a challenge. When we don't use it, we lose it. I think that's really what it comes down to. Um, there's no doubt that, that probably some medications have an impact. All right? Steroids are a fabulous medications, but they can lead to some muscle weakness. Steroids are a fabulous medication, but they can also lead to bone mineral density loss. So just something to think about. Right? So I think the, the, the simple answer is there is no simple answer. It is multifactorial. It's a lack of normal physical activity, more weakness, less flexibility, those kind of issues. But again, I think the take-home message, I hope I've brought forth a take-home message, it can get better. I'd be lying if I say it's going to get normal. I don't want to say that. That may not be true, but it can get better. You have a pill for it? I wish. Wouldn't it be great if there was a pill that would make us stronger, less short of breath, sleep better, have less anxiety, less depression? You know what? There's no pill, but you know what there is? Exercise. It's true. Exercise makes you feel better. It lessens your short of breath. It reduces anxiety, reduces depression. It is a magic pill. It's just real, it's, it's not as easy as just popping it in and swallow. You gotta do something three, four, five days a week. You gotta really work yourself. It's, it's a challenge. Thank you. Guillaume Barre, spelling. No, I think you did pretty good spelling. That's better than I would have done. Uh, weak legs, knees causes to fall. Um, absolutely. Uh, so Guillaume Barre, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar. So it, that is a, a, a degenerative neuromuscular process. Sometimes it comes and goes. You can have a, a crisis, an exacerbation, and it gets better. A crisis, but sometimes it's also slowly progressive over time. And its major uh, impact is neuromuscular weakness. All right, your muscles. The way I think of the human body, I think of a battery, a wire, and a light bulb. Right. All we care about is when you turn the switch, does the light bulb go on, right? Your battery is your brain, your nerves your, is your wiring, and your muscles are your light bulbs. Now, unfortunately, with a neuromuscular problem like Guillain-Barre, the light bulb is slowly burning out. The transmission from battery to that light bulb isn't going to happen, right? How many electricians are in the room? If you take a, a, a battery wire and a light bulb, and if you snip the wiring, does the light bulb go on? No. You need transmission. So the electrical current is that nervous impulse. So Guillain-Barre is a challenge. Um, but the one thing I would say is, again, magic, magic, magic pill, you, know, you got to keep what you got for as long as you have it. Keep what you got. Physical activity exercise is, is helpful. Thank you, everyone.